Welcome to the Target Discovery Series. Today we're going to talk about commuter ergonomics and all the different ways in which we commute and how this affects our overall health, and comfort, and productivity. So I think you'll find this very interesting and I hope that those of you who are watching the webinar or the video gain some additional insight from the visualization on the screen and of course those of you joining us for the podcast will describe everything so it's a good learning experience for all participants okay so first things first what are we here to talk about the typical US commute really illustrates in this graph how much time individuals are spending in the different methods of commuting, dip, different type of vehicles, etc. And we'll try to touch on sort of how this is affected by ergonomics across the board. So what we have here is a chart from Statista, which is actually generated from, of course that could be Statista, but I name it Statista for today. This is a chart that's available uh, from 2013 census data, so it's not that old where they asked people uh, of a certain age in the US you know, how do you commute to work and how long is that commute and this is really going to inform uh, what we're talking about today so first of all of course 76 percent of individuals say they drive to work alone this is across the United States of course certain areas cities etc have a lot more options but this is a nationwide program. We have USDA employees across the country, partner, partners across the country, and so the vast, vast majority of individuals uh, drive alone in a car to commute. At least this was the case several years ago. Um, the numbers haven't shifted that much since then. Uh, with that in mind, the actual length of the commute more more often than not it's 10 to 29 minutes about 50 percent of people um, that was their response and in fact if you look at the overall numbers um, 36 percent of people have a commute that's greater than a half an hour could be more even in more than an hour but the longer commutes are about 36 percent of the people so that's a lot of people with long commutes uh, and if you know anything about ergonomics, you know that you're not even supposed to sit in your seat for 30 to 59 minutes without getting up and taking a break. You obviously, you know, if you're driving alone, you can't get up and take a break from your car. I guess unless it's really bad traffic, and then you're getting out um, of your car and getting all frustrated like that uh, Michael Douglas movie. I can't remember the name of it though. When he gets out of his car and starts getting very frustrated. Pretty interesting movie. But uh, getting off topic here. So driving alone, that is something that is done by the vast majority. The second highest amount of respondents said that they carpooled. This surprised me. I, you know, I guess because it's across the nation, but you know, I'm surprised that carpooling was next. So you add those two together, you've got almost uh, you know 86 percent of people now across the country get to work in a car. And then you can add the next 5%, which is public transportation. That gets you up to 90% that are actually, you know, e you know, in some sort of car situation or bus. You know, they're still in, in seats and sitting in, on the road in the similar type of traffic. So you, you get all that. And then um, the other categories, of course, are working at home. That's not commuting. <laughs> Well, I guess you walk down the stairs. We do not cover um, getting up and walking down the stairs to your office as part of today's presentation, but that is a consideration. Walking, um, you know, walking, in, I don't really have any points about walking, but 2.8% you know, of people do walk to work. It's just something to consider. Uh, whereas when you look nationwide, cabs, motorcycles, and bicycles are way lower. But these last three categories of walking, Motorcycles, ride sharing through cabs, Uber, etc., and bicycle are really on the uptick, especially um, with the way things have gone here in Washington, D.C., with the metro system and some reliability issues, and ridership is going way down. And people are coming up with new ways to get to work. 
especially with things like bike sharing where you don't have to actually have you know keep the bike maintained yourself you borrow a bike from racks and and get to work that way so that's a whole big difference and there's a big increase in those areas but still I mean you kind of see how things break down across time and the type of commuting and it's a good overview of well, what are the different ways that people get to work for anybody out there that's attending the live webinar has a different way they get to work than any of these I'm happy to hear it if you submit it in the Q&A maybe somebody uh, is in Florida takes a boat to work um, you know we can talk about that um, although really you should just be telling me you know how to get your life because that's pretty lucky if you're taking a boat to work all right and this does not cover people who actually work in vehicles although a lot of it of course would be the same but our focus today is is that you're in there um, for these certain amount of times you can't really get out uh, so you have this kind of static commute it, you know it might not be the same as your neighbor but your commute is more or less the same every day in the same vehicle and you're kind of stuck in a repetitive situation that that's what causes a lot of the ergonomic concerns so that's what we're talking about here today with commuter ergonomics so what do we mean by ergonomics well first and foremost you want to be comfortable safe and productive and we have on the screen for those of you watching the webinar a word cloud with somebody writing all the different words related uh, to ergonomics besides the ones that we mentioned and of course the largest one you see is posture and then after that you see position back spine um, all these are key words that um, really come into play when it comes to commuter ergonomics uh, not just ergonomics but um, when you're really talking about being in a car being on a train etc uh, your posture and your positioning is, and especially how they affect your back and spine are huge huge factors that we're going to look at but there's all sorts of words on there uh, that can apply from uh, sitting to anatomy to physical muscular person adjustment uh, figure ache pain diagnosis so uh, some people you know they go to the doctor and this is about they think it's about ergonomics with their workstation they're having difficulty being safe and productive at their workstation at work and it turns out actually your workstation's all right it's uh, your commute that's killing you so and we're not even we were going to talk about sort of you know stress and focus and multitasking during commuting but while doing the research for this presentation that seemed to be a bit much so really we're just focusing on the physical part of it uh, how are you physically comfortable and physically safe uh, during the commute so not necessarily as much concerned about your productivity although we will talk about people who do work while they're commuting but you know you could even go further down that road and talk about things like listening to podcasts and the discovery series that you're watching now is also a podcast if you've never checked it out yourself or um, you know listening to audio books etc you know you can learn and, and gain more maybe out of your commute and be feel more positive about it mentally but we're not really focusing on that in terms of this presentation all right so this is a next slide that we're discussing it has a bunch of bullet points comparing office ergonomics to commuter ergonomics I guess if I was slick I would have compared computer ergonomics to commuter ergonomics but um, alas I was not um, but let me just run this through and kind of talk about the differences so the first principle that we really talk about with office ergonomics is fitting the job or the task to the worker kind of not the other way around uh, you don't want to be twisting your workers into into the job or task and, and causing a lot of discomfort and pain uh, when you compare that to commuter ergonomics uh, the computer is mo must off most often must be fit to the transport options so 
kind of have to do that other way around that you're trying to avoid with office ergonomics because there's a lot less flexibility. You know, you can't get, um, you can't go out and just buy an ergonomic chair and a height adjustable uh, attachment for your train ride, for example. You know, it's kind of like however you're commuting, one, once you make that decision or at least once you buy your car or who you choose to commute with, then you have the space that you're commuting in and you don't really have much you can do about that. Uh, another principle for ergonomics in the office is to seek to improve the interaction between humans and the equipment they use to perform in their jobs. So you have a computer that, or you have a microscope where you do most of your work and then okay how do you kind of compare that to the actual human being, their needs physically, their health physically. Uh, where with computer ergonomics, we're trying to improve alignment between the computer, I'm sorry, <laughs> look what I just did do myself, the commuter and the vehicle transportation options. So, all right, I'm the commuter, I am taking a bike to work every day, uh, and I'm using rideshare, so I have no control over the bicycle even, because I wasn't on the committee who decided to you know, procure the bikes and make that choice. So what can I do at this point if I'm commuting every day on a bicycle? Um, and how do I improve that alignment? And when I think about that, am I really better off bicycling? There's certainly some physical activity for me. I don't have the grind of the commute. It could be faster. Um, but maybe the positioning in the bike that I don't have control over well, maybe that's hurting me more than anything else, and I should change my way of commuting. Or maybe, okay, don't use bike share, but purchase my own ergonomic bike. And does that change the equation or not? So you're really trying to come into alignment with who you are physically, what you want to do with commuting in terms of your own mental sanity, and then the vehicle options that are available to you. And, of course, cost can be a huge factor as well. So you're trying to bring this all in alignment. Again, back to office ergonomics, it centers on designing workspaces to improve job performance. So you have a lot of opportunity to start from the ground up, you know, get a desk, get a height adjustable workstation with a keyboard tray, you know, adjustable monitor arms, etc. You, you know, you can build this uh, in the workplace. It's not kind of a ridiculous idea. Whereas with ergonomics, unless you were, you know, uh, part of a company that is um, developing trains, which we'll talk about, then you can't really do anything. So the focus here is on decreasing the pain and tension that you might feel as a result of your commute and then adjusting posture and stretching uh, to kind of accommodate that. So those are kind of the differences between traditional ergonomics and com commuter ergonomics. Um, before we go on, for those of you on the live webinar, I just wanted to remind you that the Q&A area is where you can submit any questions or concerns. And we will, if it is, fits, uh, then we will try to bring it up during the presentation. If it's beneficial to all listeners, you can be a part of this. Uh, and there's also going to be a, you know, YouTube video and a podcast of this webinar, so you can find that. Contribute to those being even more quality experiences for everyone who listens. And then, of course, uh, for those of you attending live, the captions are not working the way they normally should. But in the web links area, there is a link for the captions to open in a separate window. If you're watching this on YouTube, you obviously see the captions on the screen. And if you are listening to the podcast on SoundCloud or iTunes, you uh, could always get a transcript copy if you want it from us. All right. So driving and ergonomics. Here's where we get into the details. First and foremost, what causes aches and pains in a car or a truck or even a bus? Kind of depends. Are you the driver? Are you the passenger? You know, what are the seats like for some of the stuff going forward? But the three common concepts. They're always going to be in play no matter what type of 
you know, wheeled vehicle that goes on the road, <laughs> for lack of a better term, are poor posture, low frequency whole body vibration, um, which often comes from the vehicle on the road, and then the shape of the vehicle seat. So, so many of us are commuting for that long amount of time in a car, and we, we have poor posture the entire time for a variety of reasons. Uh, that's something that we can be aware of and improve pretty easily. Uh, we also have low frequency whole body vibration, and there's not much that we can do about that, but it can cause some tension. But it's just that's why it's important for everything else to be right. Your posture, some little breaks we'll talk about, and proper support. Uh, these are important considerations. And then, of course, we have the shape of the vehicle seat. So depending on if you're in your car, most cars have what you would at least believe are ergonomic seating designs. Um, but if you're just sitting on a bus, you know, might be a hardback, short seat, not giving you any support of all, at all. Uh, so there's kind of a wide range of uh, the shape of the seat, how it fits to you or how it fits to anybody. Some would be good for one person but not for another, and some are just terrible for everybody. And they're still trying to work on making something that is a seat, for instance, in a bus that is, you know, more supportive for everybody. All right, so first and foremost, I keep saying first and foremost, I guess this is third and third most. H how do I improve my posture? This is the question people ask us when we talk about driving and ergonomics. It's all well and good. Um, but I feel like my seat is already has me kind of, you know, up against the wheel. I have all the support I need. I mean, it's a fancy seat. It's a car. They're not going to make that incorrectly, right? Uh, so, but I guess it needs improved. So how do I improve my posture? And then how do I know? For example, uh, so many people are sharing cars. You might not be using a car sharing service, but you might be using it with your wife uh, you know you're sharing the car when she drives the car it's one night it's one way when you drive the car it's adjusted differently you're sharing with your children your partner etc so two different people two different heights weights um, arm lengths and levels of discomfort so of course some cars have presets that's what's great about those you can get yourself a hundred percent comfortable in your seat and then just have a preset so if someone else gets in there and it's like who moved who took my porridge or whatever it is, who moved the cheese. Uh, it doesn't matter too much because you can just press a button and get back to your, your seating position that you like. Uh, whereas in a lot of cars you don't have that option. You kind of have to get it get it right and hope nobody messes with it. But if you are you know, sharing a vehicle, then it's really important to focus on easy to remember things and not require a lot of adjustments when you get in the car. So there's a lot of information out there on driving and ergonomics, and we'll get into some of it, but there's three essential ways to improve posture that are important to remember. And if you can remember these, you'll be good in pretty much any car. And they might kind of seem self-evident, but just make sure you're doing them. Uh, number one is making sure you can reach controls. So some people, and I am guilty of this, however, my car is set up, I don't know if the problem is me or the car, but, you know, I kind of get things set so my legs have a lot of room, and I'm feeling pretty good about that, and when I do that, I don't know if it's the car design or I have short arms or something, but then I can't reach the controls. And so when I go to reach the controls, I'm getting myself out of position or hurting myself. So then it's like, okay, well, let me go ahead and move my legs to a better position so I can reach the controls. It's kind of a balancing act. And then you do all that, and you get to number two, uh, making sure you have enough headroom. So a lot of time, people will think about, well, my hands are supposed to be like this when I drive. And I remember I listened to some podcast and about commuter ergonomics, and they told me about making sure I can reach my controls pretty easily. And obviously I'm doing that because I want to be able to switch between my podcasts or turn my music on. So, um, of course, I want to reach my controls, but then their head, they don't have much headroom. 
But I mean, their head's not coming through the ceiling, obviously. So they, you know, they don't think too much about it. But it's actually causing them ever so slightly to put their head in the wrong position. So make sure you do have enough headroom, and then kind of plan around that. And you should really be able to reach the steering wheel without stretching. You know, your arms should not have to be straight out to reach the steering wheel. They should be able to be bent. I like the gentleman in that picture has his arms bent slightly, not necessarily 90 degrees, but uh, a little bit greater than that, I guess. Um, but easily reaching the steering wheel in the right positions without having to overreach. And then, of course, it's inter interesting because the rest of the controls in the car are usually a little further away. Um, so part of having that um, ability to reach the wheel without stretching also kind of gives you that slack in your arms to be able to reach your controls. And if your car is designed by humans, you know, everything should be similarly within reach. Now maybe you have a smartphone there or a GPS that you've got to put further away that might be causing trouble, but at least the main controls that you need uh, should all be um, reachable. And when we say reachable, we mean you know, you, you, you might lean forward like a quarter of an inch, but you shouldn't be getting way out of your primary driving position to get those. So we do have some images that I'm going to describe of a person sitting in properly and a person sitting properly. Um, and in that case, their, their seat is set so that their knees are way too high and close to the steering wheel and their thighs are not, you know, parallel to the seat you know, slash ground, depending on the setup. So you really, you know, don't want your knees kind of up in the air under the steering wheel that way. And you don't want too pronounced of an angle with your elbow. And we'll kind of get into some of those concepts as we move on. So like I said, there's lots of information out there about driving and ergonomics, posture, and other tips. So what are some other ones? that we kind of want to highlight. Well, number one, <coughs> excuse me, roll your shoulders. This might seem a little silly, but just remember every once in a while while you're driving, maybe when you get in a little more traffic, when you stop, or just, you know, when you feel you can, just kind of roll your shoulders backwards or forwards, get them some movement. movement. People don't think about their shoulders when it comes to driving in the car. And as you get older, or as you get, or you develop one of these injuries, it's your shoulders that are going to start hurting you. And you know there are cases where you are having trouble sleeping at night because your shoulder hurts. And again, you know you don't know what to blame for this, but the last thing you're thinking of uh, is just from being in a 45-minute commute each way and not really moving your shoulders during that time and having them in in the driving position. So whenever you can, roll your shoulders. Um, I'm sure that you can Google some uh, shoulder stretches or whatever you want to call them for the car. Um, but just a simple rolling of them at times really will make a difference. Uh, another thing that's recommended by professionals is uh, stoplight calf stretches. And yes, do not do these while you're driving <laughs> and on a highway. But if you're at a stoplight and you know you're stopped while that light is red, uh, you can do calf stretches. Now again, please put your car into park before you do this. Target Center is not responsible for anyone that you rear end doing this. But it is a, um, a known to be effective exercise that you can do it. But you do have to get your car stopped uh, so you can get your foot off the brake and you can just kind of place your foot down and put your toes down and, and kind of make your calf feel a little bit of a stretch. So, you know, just do that for a little bit, just for a second while you're at a stoplight uh, with each leg and then be done. So it's something to consider. Um, next step, next tip. Um, this is very important. Uh, this is probably important no matter where you go. Make sure that your ears are over your shoulders. And we don't mean as opposed to your shoulders being over your ears, which is a totally different problem, but 
make sure that your ears are directly over your shoulders. Uh, and there's an image on the screen of a wrong and right way uh, with a woman in a car. The woman in the wrong position is kind of leaning forward uh, at a strange angle and not against her seat back. Kind of like it looks like, oh, she must not be able to see very well. She's leaning forward. And as a result, her ears, even though you can't see them because they're behind her hair, are not above her shoulders. They're like above her thighs. So they are too far forward. So the correct position is that she's sitting straight up with her back against the backrest and her ears are right over her shoulder. Uh, and, you know, we'll talk about this again in a second, but, you know, you can use a pillow for some back support if that helps get you to that situation. And I don't mean some special pillow, just a small pillow. Um, all right, another tip is to get into your car rear end first. And again, we don't take any responsibility, any liability, anything that happens to you when you try to go rear end first into your car. But uh, it does help some people. So normally uh, what you do is kind of crouch and step in with one foot and awkwardly contort your body, especially lower cars, to get in. So... Um, even if it's your Ferrari, uh, the lower it is, then the more this might be a concern. Uh, but the best you can do is get in your car rear end first. Now, I'm not saying you should do this necessarily, but if you are feeling discomfort um, from your commute, you, want, you might want to consider all parts of it, including entry and exit. So you just open your door. Definitely open your door first. Very important part. I should have said that. Then... Get your rear end near the entrance to the car. Go sit down that way. And then pull your legs around. Um, and interestingly, when you get older, um, you know, eventually that might be how you had to get in a car anyway. Um, but uh, for now, for those of you still working, uh, you can still decrease some pain and discomfort. Uh, using this method. Lumbar pillow is on our list. You know, we kind of talked about that, getting that proper positioning. For some people, uh, their their seat might be able to get them in the proper positioning, but it doesn't give them the comfort and support they need right in that lumbar. So you can get a lumbar pillow. And you can get ones that are made for the car, or again, you can just try any uh, smaller pillow. But our general recommendation is if you are really need not just benefiting but really needing lumbar support at your workstation for work um, you should make sure that you have a little extra support in the car as well unless it's only like a 10 minute commute for you but if you're anyone more than the 10 excuse me 10 minute commutes you really want to uh, think about some support and then finally take a walk and uh, now I do this by default every morning, and it's a bit of a disaster, but I have about a, I guess, 40-minute commute each way on a good day. Could be, could be shorter, but uh, I'd say on average a 40-minute commute. And I try to do a lot of these things, um, but when I get out of my car, um, and by the way, uh, do not get out rear end first, but when I get out of my car, I definitely have maybe stiff legs, maybe stiff arm, um, and but then I have to walk maybe 10 minutes from my car to my office, and it's a bit rough at first, but it kind of gets everything going, uh, gets the kinks out is the expression, hopefully it's an appropriate expression, and so it's just recommended if you're um, driving to work and you have the luxury of parking right underneath your works, your office, uh, make sure you find some way to take a little bit of a walk after that long car ride. All right. So, just, okay, great information, terrible information. You might have different opinions on it, but the next thing most people want to know is how do I adjust the driver's seat? So we have an illustration on the screen of a drawing of a person in a driver's seat trying to illustrate some of these concepts. And first of all, you want to raise the height so you can see 
uh, at least three inches over the steering wheel. So basically just try to visualize yourself with your steering wheel in the proper positioning. Your hands are in the right spot. You've kind of adjusted some of the other ways we talked about. You know, you should be able to see at least three inches over the steering wheel. Uh, so raise or lower the seat so that's the case. Or if you have an adjustable steering wheel, you might have options in both ways. Uh, the other thing you want to do is move your seat forward or backwards so you can easily push the pedals with your whole foot, not just your toes. You'd be surprised how many people are driving with their toes. It seems probably like a safety hazard, but their positioning is just odd, and they just wind up driving with their toes, not their whole foot. Um, and not only is that a safety hazard, but it's, it's bad for you. So move your seat forward or backwards, no matter how much of a junker or a wonderful car you have. Uh, you ought to be able to at least move the seat uh, forward and backward. I think you could even do that back when it was like two seats together. <laughs> uh, so you know, move it forward and backwards so you can easily push those pedals. So now you can, um, you know, the right distance, you can see over the steering wheel, fine. You're not like the little old lady peering over the wheel, and you can easily push that pedal. And now you're in a lot better position. You also have to be concerned with angling the seat, if that's possible. Now, some seats do not allow for angling, so then, you know, you could try a cushion, or you can just give up on this one. But uh, the kind of you want that 90 degree L shape for your seating uh, when possible, and then you want that angled seat to be within one to three degrees of that. So you got a lot of considerations. How do you want your back to be? How do you want the seat pan to be? And how do you get that overall L shape or, or within one to three degrees of it? And then you want to center your steering wheel. It should be about 10 to, in, to 12 inches from your breastbone. So again, it's just a matter of distance to that steering wheel for the you know, give you a little more information on how far it should be. But of course, everyone's arms are different length, so you got to keep that in mind. If for some reason, uh, you know, you have 20-inch arms, you, that won't work. And of course, lift your headrest so the top is at level with the top of your head. Anybody who has children knows that's what you're looking for uh, with the car seat adjustment with the head, so you're used to that. Same thing for the grown-ups, uh, if at all possible. In the illustration that we have, the person is taller than the seating, and therefore the headrest is not level with the top of their head. Uh, but if at all possible, you would like that. All right, so that's the end of cars. And that's a long amount on cars, because 90% of you are taking cars to work for long drives. But some of you, and if you're in Washington, D.C., or other areas, more of you, are taking trains or bikes or motorcycles, so let's get into those. So first of all, if you're riding a train to work or a subway, metro, whatever you want to call it, do you use your smartphone? Because we're going to talk a little bit later about smartphone ergonomics, because if you're commuting, and hopefully this is not for you people who are driving, but anyone else, you might be using your smartphone, that could actually be contributing. Do you work on a laptop? Some people are trying to do multiple things, multitask, get some work done while they're on a train, etc. Okay, well, there's some considerations to think about. Do you stand? Some people riding the subway in New York, Metro, Washington, D.C., they're standing and holding on to a pole, but still maybe using that smartphone, maybe not. So, you know, if you're one of the people who commutes by train, think about, think about this. This is kind of giving you an overall idea of where you fit into the, the spectrum of ergonomic concern for trains and ergonomics. And finally, and this applies to those of you who have been thoroughly bored by this presentation as well, do you take a nap? So maybe you're listening to the podcast of this discovery series on a train and the dulcet tones, the next thing you know, uh, you're asleep. Or maybe you plan to sleep on the train. That's how you catch up. That's how you get a nap. Because uh, if you're thinking about it, well, you know, maybe there are some considerations. And in the photo on the screen, of course, the gentleman not only has headphones on and using a laptop, but he is fast asleep napping in a train. So uh, 
not only maybe was he hurting himself working, although if he's using headphones maybe to talk on the phone, that could be better than holding a phone to your ear, but um, you know maybe he was hurting himself the way he's working, but then also the way he naps, he might you know get into a bad position as well. All right, so laptop users. The first thing you need to ask yourself, and this kind of gets to similar to office economics, or are you positioned properly? All right, you are trying to be a hot shot, work at work, and then take your commute and do work then too. You're a very important person. You got to work the whole time. Okay, that's fine. Um, but how is your laptop? Is it huge? Is it tiny? Uh, are you holding it on your lap, like? because it's a laptop or is there a tray that you have it on? How are you set up? And if so, are you kind of looking down at the screen in a, in a way that's really hurting your neck? Are you having to reach to have it at a better height? Um, you know, what are your considerations? And of course, are you using an ergonomic accessory? Because that would be best. You know, there are devices you can buy and there's a photo of one for those of you watching this live or on YouTube. Uh, that, that's one of the companies called Gold Touch, and they make a Bluetooth keyboard for mobile professionals. Microsoft does the same thing, Logitech, other companies. So it'll connect to your tablet or your PC or your Mac, and uh, it'll give you a, a keyboard that you're able to position more ergonomically, uh, if possible. So consider that. It might help you a little bit. Uh, if it's really hurting you, you might have to not work on the train. You might have to nap instead. Those others of you that are standing, or in some ways you can think about how this might apply to somebody who is sitting and just using their smartphone the whole time, um, or that person that's on the metro when you're trying to just relax, have that nap, and they're having some loud, annoying phone call, argument with the coworker, maybe holding the phone up to their ear the whole time. But at least you know that long phone calls cause problems with elbows, neck, and shoulders. So maybe they won't be able to keep it up the whole time, even if they have wireless connection in the subway. So think about that. If you're the person using the phone calls, try not to disturb those around you. But if you must, if you must, please remember that long calls uh, can cause problems with eye, you know, elbows, neck, and shoulders if you are holding the phone to your ear. If you are holding it correctly and using headphones, um, you know, you can get rid of a lot of those problems. The other thing is texting, tweeting, Instagramming. Well, actually, Instagramming is better than tweeting because usually less text. Um, anything that's text input uh, into your smartphone can put excess, excessive stress on your fingers, thumbs, shoulders, and neck. So. And there's an illustration on the page showing the different degrees of your head positioning from zero up to about 90, I guess, uh, 80 degrees, um, where people kind of fall within the range. And the uh, higher your neck is bent, you know, the more likely you might feel some pressure and injury on yourself. But most importantly, if there is a sudden stop or something happens, uh, you are way more at risk for worse injury if you are positioned like that than if you're just standing straight up, you know, zero degrees um, using your phone. And then, of course, you'd have to kind of glance down at your phone or maybe hold it up higher. So most people you know, are not able to get themselves into the best position unless they held the phone way up in their face, which would be kind of socially awkward and also... Um, you know, might not work for you holding your arm up like that. So most people wind up maybe somewhere between 0 and 15 degrees, a slight head tilt down, holding their arm slightly higher, and try to use the device that way. So you probably haven't thought about this, but wherever you're standing and using your phone, you know, think about, okay, how am I positioned? Can I get, I now know this proper positioning is standing straight up. Again, my ears are over my shoulders. And uh, how do I get in that position and still use my mobile device? Uh, and sometimes it's a matter of applications that help you using voice control uh, and using accessories. So you can use something like this. Uh, on the screen, we have a Plantronics Bluetooth headset that you can put on your ear. 
Now I know Bluetooth headsets are like so five years ago and that's not cool anymore. But some people, especially workers, still use them. And so keep this in mind. It will help you not have to have your hand on your ear the whole time. Uh, if you must use this mobile device. Um, and also it gives you some freedom from the headphones if you can use, you know, for both ears, Bluetooth headphones for mobile users. And there are apps and settings that can also improve the way you use your phone. So if you know how to do some dictation into your phone, some voice controls, you know, you can help take some stress off of your arms or the tilting of the neck. Uh, and there's other apps, you know, that help you use your phone, for example, with one hand or settings on the iPhones. For instance, you know, if you have an iPhone, the larger one, 6 Plus, whatever it's called now, there's certain ways to kind of make it so that you can reach uh, the furthest parts of the screen with a trick versus, you know, your other hand. And that can help you as well. But that can be a whole other discovery series and probably will be. So we just touch on it here. All right, and then we kind of talked about it, but then there's the future of train commutes as well. And so on our screen, we have two different images of, you know, one sort of type of train commuting that's being developed in the future. And so there's two problems. The first problem is space. So if you really want to have some good ergonomic support and a place to put your tablets and your drink, etc., uh, like in the image on the right side of the screen in, in the train that you see, uh, well then of course it takes up more space and a lot of these commuter trains need to be able to fit as many people maybe during busier times but then have more room during other times. So they're working on developing these seating solutions that you know give you good support and still allow you to fit as many people as possible and then can be adjusted to be larger uh, more luxurious space, you know, when possible. And then to also consider how are people actually using these trains uh, to do work. In the image, most of the people, some people are just sitting and talking, another person I think is napping, and the other person, which is also a shadow, is reading a book. Uh, but of course you could be on a smartphone as well. And in the other picture, there's somebody actually using an iPad and a smartphone uh, on trays that are in the almost like the kind of trays you see on an airplane. You don't often see these on trains. But, you know, thinking about this whole setup, thinking about ergonomics, really is something that's going on right now uh, with the train developers. All right, so now in the D.C. area especially, um, as there becomes more problems with Metro, or perceived problems, but probably real problems with Metro, people are turning to other ways to get to work. Uh, especially during what they called safe track, uh, biking to work became a lot, something that's a lot more used, at least here in the Washington, D.C. area, even though we see nationwide as a small amount of the commuters in the world, or in the nation, sorry. So we have an image of a gentleman on a bike. Uh, hopefully these images have been diverse and covered a full range of the American workforce, but sometimes, you know, they're not. So we do our best, though, and in this case, uh, there is a gentleman uh, he's probably not commuting to work unless he works. Well, he's an older gentleman, I guess. So I don't think he's a Gen Xer wearing jeans and a polo to work. So we'll, he might not be going to work. But either way, it shows you a bicycle and sort of the right way to position your back. So you kind of have that natural curve of your spine versus kind of a hunched over way of riding the bike where you just have a, a curve. Uh, not like the natural spine type curve, but just a curve the way you think of it. So it's really hard to describe this for those of you who can't see it, but um, the most important consideration with biking and ergonomics, besides some of the tips we're going to go over, is to have that more natural back position while you're riding the bike. Alright, so what should your bike do for you if you're considering your biking options or if you want to know how to improve them? First of all, it should support you properly while you're riding. So we showed you that picture, talked about that picture, how the man is riding with his back in the right position. When you're doing that, you know, your bike should support you so that you feel comfortable and that you can still have superior handling for safe driving, riding, I guess, riding of the bike is the proper term, and that you are optimizing your joint position, your range of motion, and your posture, and you're optimizing where you interact with the bike. And those are fancy words for saying 
You need to be able to sit on it, be comfortable, control it safely, and wherever you have to touch it, such as the handlebars or the any gears, etc., it should not be very difficult for that interaction. And that should not cause you any additional discomfort or extra pressure needed, for instance, to change the gears or pull the brake. So with that in mind, some people are like, this is great, I use bike sharing, I'll do what I can, make sure to try to think about my positioning better, but there's not much I can do. Others might say, yeah, maybe there's some things I can improve with my bike. Or some people say, you know, I am committed to biking to work for the rest of my life and I want a proper ergonomic bike, where do I find that? Well, really, any quality bike can be adjusted to meet basic needs in terms of ergonomics. But if you truly are concerned about discomfort you are feeling from biking to work and your positioning, uh, there are vendors that do um, customize bikes with ergonomics in mind. And again, I, custom, I should say customize build from scratch versus here's my bike, please customize it for me. And one of those is uh, ergonbike.com. So that's bikes and ergonomics. Another kind of bike, but with a motor, is a motorcycle. And we have an illustration, for those of you viewing, uh, of a uh, man, I, I don't know, a figure on a bicycle and sort of showing the different angles involved in terms of steering wheel to the wheel relationship and where the hands are and sort of the, how the feet and legs are and, and the overall positioning of the body. And there are some standards involved here, but then some bikes get pretty custom as well. So if you're riding your bike every day to work and back, and it's a longer than 10-minute ride, you, know, you really want to be thinking about it. And we wanted to bring this to your attention, but honestly, this is something that we're a little bit outside of uh, our knowledge area in terms of knowing a lot about motorcycles. <laughs> but there are still some concerns that we're aware of that we wanted to share with you. First of all, um, you've got to consider the rider dimensions. So depending on your height and inseam, kind of the way you're set on your bike, um, the way you might be comfortable on any specific bike can be affected. In terms of vehicle customization, uh, there are some things you can do in most bikes. That includes handlebar rise, so you can raise up the handlebar, handlebar pullback, and then the seat rise. So you do have some control over most of these areas um, to kind of fit to your body depending on your height and inseam. And then it's a matter of you know your feet being on or off the ground, how straight are your arms, uh, and placement on the seat. When we say feet on or off the ground, we mean when you're not riding. Uh, obviously your feet are not going to be on the ground while you're riding, but how, how hard is it for you, how close are your feet to the ground when you take them off the bicycle pedal? I shouldn't say pedal because that's not how the bicycle works, how motorcycle works. I don't know. Obviously, I'm getting to the end of this um, too long, I guess, uh, presentation if I'm, I'm messing up those words. But, you know, wherever, I don't know the official term for where you put your feet on a motorcycle, but, um, you know, when you take it off there onto the ground, uh, does it touch the ground? And how, how far off are you? How, what is your leg positioning when you do that? And then, of course, usually on the seat, it's not like here's where you sit in this really tiny space. There's usually some, you know, no oh, foot pegs. Somebody, see, this is why you do live webinars. Thank you. Somebody listening, right, uh, knew to say foot pegs for where you put your feet. Okay, great. So when you take your feet out of the foot pegs and onto the ground, you know, is that a seamless process? Oh, two people said foot pegs. So this is great. Thank you, everybody. I don't even have to know everything. But um, you know, sometimes you see two people sharing a motorcycle. So obviously, you know, there's a lot of room on a seat, or, or sometimes they're sitting up on the back. But that is something you can control to try to get some, you know, the optimum positioning in a motorcycle. Um, and uh, you know, there are some great resources. Again, if you kind of Google motorcycles and ergonomics, you can find some PDFs of some great papers of research done, and kind of help you get into that correct positioning, which is where that image that we're using comes from. All right, so that's it. We covered all the different ways of transportation. We talked about ergonomics, the general concept, and how that applies to commuting. 
And then we talked about some tips and tricks and possible equipment that might help you in these different situations. We also learned that you put your feet on foot pegs. That's what they're called. So hopefully um, you all learned at least one thing just like I did and uh, benefited from this presentation. Uh, if you are somebody who is commuting and you're a USDA employee, um, I do suggest you contact Target Center um, at um, our website or through target-center at usda.gov, which is our email. And um, you know, let us know. Hey, I'm commuting. I'm having some trouble with my car, etc. Do you have any recommendations? Because just like ergonomics for the office, we can do this presentation for you. But at the end of the day, everything is individualized. So, um, USDA employees, you know, we can kind of provide that service. Anybody else listening, watching, you know, we're happy to try to answer any questions you might have um, as well. So we provided our. Uh, for those of you who are watching this. You can see our um, contact information. Anybody, uh, please, we recommend you follow us at USDA Target on Twitter as well. And then, of course, I do recommend that you go to our website. You can just, again, Google USDA Target Center. And on our home page under Popular Topics, you can start my target experience to submit a request uh, if you want any follow-up services. So with that being said, uh, I hope you learned something today. For those of you who want to share this with others, uh, we will be providing uh, the recording of this. will be on our YouTube page as well as on our website through Target 365. And for those of you who want to listen during your newly more ergonomic commute, a podcast version will be available sometime tomorrow. Uh, again, you can get to that through our website or through SoundCloud iTunes, uh, wherever you get, most places you get your podcast. Uh, so with that being said, thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next time on the Target Discovery Series.